Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to part three. This is the last part of a, a three-part series on the skeletal system. And as I mentioned in the other two parts, this is uh, for introductory level high school anatomy classes. Um, you'll notice in this slide that there are blanks there. These blanks are for uh, specifically for my students. This is the way that I normally teach when I'm in the classroom. And I have my students uh, fill in those blanks to uh, help with their learning and also with their uh, attention as well. Uh, so you could, if you're not one of my students, you can certainly use this as a self-quiz for you and see if you can fill in the blanks before I get to them. And hopefully that will be of help to you. So uh, let's begin with the spine. So I'm going to spend a, a few minutes talking about the spine and some characteristics of it. So abnormal curvatures, we have three of them. Uh, one, the first one, this, this occurs when uh, temporarily uh, when a woman is pregnant or someone with a large gut. Uh, that is called lordosis. lordosis. The second one, which we would maybe classify as a hunchback or, or say that it, it, the person appears to have a hunched back, that would be kyphosis. And then a lateral curvature, which uh, I've had a number of students with this, unfortunately, that's called scoliosis. And perhaps you yourself uh, suffer from this abnormal curvature. And scoliosis can be uh, very debilitating for people. And, and, I, and I feel badly for you if that's the case. Um, I've had a couple of students who have required surgery and, and uh, special uh, educational environments because of, of the pain that they have to endure as a result of that. Uh, so uh, anyway, if, if you have that, I, I feel badly for you. Um, the spine has the bones of it, which are called vertebrae, that possess many processes for muscle attachment. And so we have ones that go, go outwards. They're called traverse heading out laterally to the sides, and then the spinous processes, which are uh, projecting out uh, dorsally from, from the vertebrae themselves. Um, intervertebral discs uh, are in between each, each vertebrae, and they can herniate under stress. And so these discs provide uh, some cushion, some support, uh, flexibility, increases range of motion. Uh, between the vertebrae, uh, and so these discs act as, as a uh, primarily as a cushion between those bones. And as a result of these discs, we have a pretty substantial range of motion between these slightly movable uh, bones of the spine. And I just wanted to highlight uh, because they are they they actually have a name uh, names of C1 and C2. In other words, cervical vertebra one and cervical vertebra two. That's the first one is called the atlas and named after the, the Greek character who holds and supports the weight of the earth on his shoulders. That is the atlas. And then the second one, C2, would be the axis. And that enables our head to pivot um, and, and so that we can say no to somebody, for example. So C1 and C2 are called the atlas and axis. And you can see the picture of the, the spine anatomy in the upper left, where we have the spinous process uh, protruding out uh, dorsally from the actual body of the vertebra, and then the transverse processes heading out both sides. Um, I have an ultrasound there of, of a fetus in the lower left, and you can see the curvature of the spine. It's a gentle, uniform curve from the base of the skull uh, clear uh, back to the end of the vertebrae. But you'll notice in the, the graphic on the right, we have these the curve there, and in, in the picture that I have up at the top in curve W, uh, we have the, the cervical curve. Then the thoracic curve kind of remains the same. If you compare it to the ultrasound of the fetus, the thoracic curve is, is pretty much doesn't change. It, it remains with us uh, for the rest of our lives. But T in the lumbar curvature, that, that's definitely quite different than, than it is in, in the uh, fetal ultrasound there. So I asked the question, okay, when do these curves form? The, referring to the cervical curve and, and the lumbar curve. Well, if you think, let's start with the top at the cervical curve. Think about during our lives. When would that cervical curve begin? Instead of being this gently uniform curve, it's kind of going 
upward or, or back against that curve? Well, that's going to occur when we're very young, just a few months old, and we begin to lift our heads. So this would be the curvature in our necks. And so when we start lifting our heads, and we do that re repeatedly again and again, and then of course it develops over the, the, the course of our childhood then, um, that cervical curvature takes shape. And then skip the thoracic because that really doesn't change much. It pretty much stays the same under normal circumstances. Uh, the lumbar curvature, okay, when do you think that curvature forms? That's going to be when we begin walking at about one year of age, typically. I mean, that greatly varies, of course, from person to person, but uh, under, uh, on average, about one year of age, we develop that lumbar curvature uh, due to us trying to stand upright and walking and moving our way around coffee tables and so forth. And any of you that have children, you uh, certainly know what I'm talking about. Uh, you can see some pictures of them in the upper left. You can see lordosis, where you have an exaggerated lumbar curve. And so it's going to pinch on those intervertebral discs that are in between the vertebrae, and, and that's going to cause some problems, some pain as well. In the middle, we have uh, an adolescent male, which uh, he's presenting with kyphosis. It's definitely noticeable when he's uh, leaning over, but even when he's standing up, you can see how he's got a, a an abnormal thoracic curvature. But it's of course uh, easily noticeable when when the young man bends down. And then scoliosis, you can see the lateral curvature of the spine there as well. Now the bottom one is is kind of a funny one there, but. Um, it's referring to our lives sitting at computers. Now, not so much today because uh, teenagers are on their phones so much, but if you have a job where you're at a computer, this is called postural kyphosis because you spend so many hours leaning over. Maybe if you're a gamer, you're going to be uh, leaning over like this for hours at a time and you don't even notice it because you're so engaged in whatever you're doing. Um, your your uh, spine is starting to take this uh, this form of, uh, of kyphosis here. Um, now, postural kyphosis is not permanent. This is, is a reversible uh, abnormal curvature, um, but it can create problems if uh, you're continually or quite often sitting at a computer leaning over, as you can see in this, this picture of a person, which, by the way, is not real. Um, it's just computer generated, but it looks it looks like a real x-ray. It's pretty clever. Um, but I just wanted to get that point across that leaning over like that can lead to postural kyphosis. Here is a, a uh, young person who uh, I, I have two MRIs. One on the, the one on the left shows pre-surgery and the one on the right shows post-surgery. And you can see her the, the scoliosis of this, this young person's spine was pretty severe. After surgery, things have straightened up qu quite a bit. Um, those are rods, the, the, the white parallel um, rods running down her spine, and, and the things that, that look like pins or nails, those are, are screws that are holding those, those rods in place, and they're screwed into the vertebrae in order to straighten up the spine. Um, and, and create more of an, uh, of an upright position. If you have kyphosis as severe as the one on the left, um, they have all kinds of, of body braces to wear while sleeping at night, or, or even if in severe cases, they, they wear these, these mostly plastic body braces throughout the day as well in order to try to uh, alleviate the pain and the pressure that is being created by this severe scoliosis. Um, in this particular instance, it was so bad, uh, this young person needed to have surgery done to correct the severe lateral curvature. Uh, herniated discs can form, and you can see on the left the, the area of herniation where a disc slips out of place. So how do you treat a herniated disc? Well, there are a number of ways. Usually, though, um, you don't have to treat them. They'll, they'll pop out and remain there for a while, but then they'll work their way back into the space between the vertebrae, and, and no uh, actual treatment is needed, no surgery or uh, the number of different ways that they uh, can repair herniated discs. And you can see in the, the MRI on the right, the 
uh, disk between L3 and L4 is looking like a fairly normal intervertebral disk. But then you can see the disks between L4 and L5 and the disk between L5 and S1, uh, sacral vertebra number one, has pretty severe herniation there. That, I assume, is going to require um, some surgery due to the fact that they had an MRI taken and so the next step then will be uh, for the orthopedist to then uh, take care of this in a and they have a few different ways to repair herniated discs depending on the patient the level of severity and so forth there are a number of factors that have to be taken into account um, with the joints there I have uh, three basic types of joints um, and I have a, a little uh, acronym, mnemonic, to help you remember them. Three basic types. There's the synarthrosis, which are immovable. And so an example of those would be sutures. Amphiarthrosis, which are slightly movable, like in our vertebral joints. And diarthrosis, which is freely movable. And those ones are synovial. The other two are not. Synarthrotic uh, joints and amphiarthrotic joints are non-synovial. Diarthrotic joints are. So that would be like our elbow, or our shoulder, our hips, etc. Okay. So uh, synarthroses and amphiarthroses are not synovial. Diarthroses are synovial. And I use the the um, mnemonic SAD for the first letter of all three of them, S-A-D, and maybe that'll help you remember them as well. Uh, the prefixes kind of refer to um, what they, their, their mobility, so sin means they are, are, are joints that are, are kind of in sync with each other. They're, they're joined together through sutures, as you can see in the lower left picture there the, on the cranium, the sutures how they're kind of like zipped and woven together. Amphiarthrosis, amphi, you sure think of the term amphibian, meaning these are creatures that live, quote, double lives. And so these ones are slightly movable. They can kind of move, but not too much. So I guess that's why they use the prefix amphi. And then die arthrosis, dies too. So it must be referring to moving in two directions, or, or in this case, in the cases of these joints, in multiple directions, in the case of, say, the shoulder or the hip. Um, so those three pictures are demonstrating or, or showing examples of those three different types of joints. Now, what are some disorders? So strains and sprains, we get these terms confused sometimes because they sound so similar, just like osteoblasts and osteoclasts. They differ by only one letter. So an overstretching of a muscle or a tendon is a strain. So the T in strain, think tendon, and maybe that'll help you remember it. So overstretching of a muscle or a tendon is a strain. Overstretching of a ligament is a sprain. So when they get overstretched too far, you have sprained a ligament. Um, rheumatologists will deal with these next three disorders, among others. Um, but these are three uh, major ones that rheumatologists will, will deal with and treat. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic autoimmune inflammatory disorder, typically affecting the joints in your hands and your feet is where it's seen most often. So the term rheumatoid refers to um, the flare-ups, the you'll have uh, times when the there's a lot of pain and inflammation, and then you'll have times when it's not as bad. So think of like a sine wave where it's going up and it becomes excruciatingly painful, and then you go through a time when it's not as much, and then it becomes really bad again. And so that's why they use the word rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, osteo referring to the the bone, and, and by the way, arth, A-R-T-H, means a joint or an articulation, and then itis means inflammation. So osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis in, in this country. It occurs when 
cartilage and joints wears down over time. And so as that cartilage that, that cushions our bones and separates them and prevents us from, from the bones uh, grinding against each other, that cartilage wears down over time. And, and then you have two ends of bones rubbing against each other and it becomes extremely painful um, and, and creates inflammation as a result of that. Uh, gout occurs when sharp, needle-like uric acid crystals. So the uric acid crystallizes and then the, the, the uric acid doesn't get broken down properly because of a lack of enzymes or, or not producing the enzymes required to break down the uric acid. So these uric acid crystals, they accumulate around the joint and you think crystals and joints, that's a bad combination and it is. It causes inflammation and intense pain. So you can see pictures of them here. The one on the the two on the left are showing uh, rheumatoid arthritis. You can see the the individual on the bottom uh, showing his fingers, and you can imagine how difficult that must be to carry out daily tasks because of the the extreme curvature uh, of the fingers. And then you can see it above in an X-ray what the fingers uh, look like there. Um, so a lot of therapy necessary for this, occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, and, and treatments and medications as well. You can see in the one on the right that's showing gout. The one on the bottom is, is just what it looks like um, macroscopically, just looking at the, the, the person's hand. Um, then you can see what it looks like under an x-ray. Uh, a normal foot on the left and then gout in the toe so these uric acid crystals accumulate and they actually appear under an x-ray um, just to confirm that that's what would be going on and and with that amount of inflammation you look at that that man's hand you, you know, just looking at it you know there's pain there so what happens as we age as uh, to our skeleton and to our bones? Well, the cartilage begins to calcify. So we lose that cushioning effect and, and uh, the benefit of the cartilage that's separating our bones, and it begins to calcify. Um, remember, our bones were cartilage, hyaline cartilage at one time, and that hyaline cartilage calcified. So as we get older, this is what happens to the cartilage that we would like to stay cartilage begins to calcify and, and, and lose its pliability and its shock absorption qualities and uh, the benefits that we get in our joints from the cartilage being there. Osteoporosis, so in this case your, your bones become porous as you can see in the, the picture there, normal bone on the left and osteoporotic bone on the right. So bone density greatly decreases and osteoclast function is, is much more active than osteoblast function. There's slower, less effective healing. And I ask the question, why? Um, um, and, and I ask this question at the end of, of all of the, the systems of the body that we look at. Why is there slower, less effective healing? Almost always it's because of reduced blood flow. So there's less blood flowing there, there's fewer nutrients, less oxygen, um, cells can't heal themselves nearly as, as quickly as they did when we were young, and so we have slower, less effective healing. It takes much longer for the bones to heal as a result of, of a reduced blood supply. Now, this gets into the next part here as well, which we'll talk about in a minute marrow transformation as we age. So the marrow in our bodies undergoes transformation as we get older. In infants, it's almost entirely red marrow. So producing a lot of blood cells. And so we're deriving the benefit from that. Remember, these are not just red cells. So often students think, well, when we say blood cells, we only mean, mean red cells. But no, the whole host of blood cells that come from that, the white cells, the lymphocytes, and of course the red cells too. So you can see how this is going to be a benefit to an infant. And, and as we, when we hit middle age, we hit kind of the middle, 50-50, red to yellow marrow ratio in our 40s. And so we have about a half the amount of marrow is red and about a half the, the marrow is yellow. In elderly, we get the opposite of infants. We're almost entirely yellow marrow. So what does this mean? Well, if you remember red marrow, that's where hematopoiesis is occurring. 
We have almost entirely yellow marrow when we're old, so fewer blood cells. And so we're, we, we suffer from the effects of, again, not just having the, the red cells, but also not having the immune cells, the white cells, the lymphocytes as well. So um, this creates immune system problems too as a result of this conversion transformation to yellow marrow. Well, that ends our discussion. This ends the PowerPoint presentation on the skeletal system, my uh, uh, two-part series, which became a three-part series. Um, hopefully, this has given you a better understanding of the skeletal system and uh, will uh, be of, uh, of benefit to you. Uh, so thank you for watching.